Hi, my name is Nathan Klein. I've been at Lander since 2011. I completed my graduate and undergraduate work at Clemson University. I'm a human factors psychologist, which is an area of applied industrial psychology. Uh, human factors is also known as ergonomics, which is the study of human capabilities and limitations applied to the design of systems and technologies. My interests include ergonomics and usability, uh, industrial design, technology use, and developing and assessing competency and learning using educational technologies. Before we get started, I want to give a quick demonstration. I want you to imagine that we're at a dinner party and somebody asks you to pass the salt. Uh, quickly, reach for which uh, shaker that you would give them. Would you reach for the one on the right or the left? As you do this, you, several thoughts may have raced through your head, uh, but undoubtedly somebody will have passed the pepper on accident. When I ask people, which one did you choose? If you choose the one on the left, why? I hear a variety of answers. Um, and it usually has something to do with the number of holes that are in the top of the, the salt shaker, or the pepper shaker. Uh, so you're, to pass the salt and pepper, you have to think and remember some type of rule and apply it. I've heard anything from well, the, obviously the uh, salt is on the um, right because it has uh, the most holes and people really like salt. I've heard also that the pepper is the one that's on the right because it has the most holes because pepper is larger and it's more difficult to come out. Turns out there is no universal standard. So in order for you to effectively pass the salt and pepper, uh, it would depend on who filled the salt and pepper originally. Um, so how could we go about changing the design of a salt and pepper shaker in order to reduce the error of you passing the pepper when somebody asks for the salt? So we could possibly label the salt and pepper shakers. Uh, we could put an S on the salt or a P on the pepper. Uh, that would require you to read. Uh, that would work if you're literate. Uh, if you're not, that'd be unfortunate. Uh, or if you're in a different country, it wouldn't be effective. I've heard people say, well, we could color code them. Black would be pepper, white would be salt, and that would be more obvious unless you're colorblind. Um, so maybe the best design was we could make them clear. And then when you pass the pepper, you're literally passing the pepper. You see what you're, or when you pass the salt, you're literally pass it, passing the salt. Here we have a very slick faucet. If you look at it, uh, this looks like something my wife would pick out at the Home Depot. Uh, but the first thing I would ask her when she brought it home would be, how do you turn that thing on? I've heard anything from you just you push the top down like a soap dispenser, or you twist the tip of it at the end of the faucet, or you twist the base of it. Um, maybe you wave your hands in front of it like a motion detector. The point is, is it looks good, but it would be difficult to use. And if you were at that same dinner party and you went to wash your hands, God forbid somebody walk in the kitchen when you're waving your hands in front of it trying to test to see if it has a motion detector, uh, they probably think you're crazy. I don't know how you turn it on, but I knew, do know it's confusing. So here we have a more traditional uh, faucet, which is obvious how we tur would turn it on. Um, but which one is the hot water? What do you reach for to turn on the hot water? Um, a lot of people will say on the left. Hot water is always on the left. Some people will say right. Um, there's obviously some kind of convention that we're applying um, that's supposedly universal. So normally hot water is on the left, but turns out it comes uh, back to how did your plumber plumb your house? Uh, hopefully they plumbed it the right way, which would be hot water on the left. So how could we change it to make it more obvious? Again, we could, we could label it putting an H and a C for hot and cold, uh, or we could color code it. Maybe making a blue would mean cold, red would mean hot. In fact, they even sell these additions that you can add to your uh, faucets to make things more obvious. So what is human factors and ergonomics? I've given you some examples and I've told you that it's the study uh, or the investigation of human capabilities and limitations applied to the design of systems and technologies. But what does that mean? That's a mouthful. So we can be good psychologists and break this down. So what do we mean by investigation? So investigation just basically means that we're gonna look at things in more detail. We're gonna examine them closely. We're gonna try to quantify them. We're going to try to weigh their effects. We're going to research them. We're going to document these things. So 
what are human capabilities and limitations. In lay terms, um, human capabilities and limitations basically just means what people can and cannot do. So within society, we see that there's a wide range of human capabilities and limitations, all the way from somebody who can dunk a basketball from the free throw line, uh, to grandma who has trouble walking down the street uh, without her walker, to the vertically challenged or even children, to who are arguably the most capable individuals in society, maybe fighter pilots. They're operating multi-million dollar pieces of machinery, several times the speed of sound, doing maneuvers that literally force the blood from their brain so they have difficulty concentrating and can possibly black out. So we are studying and investigating what people can and can't do. And we do this and it's applied to the design of systems and technology. So what does that mean? What does applied mean? Applied means that we're going to use that information uh, to design something. So what does design mean? Design means that we're going to create or make something. And systems and technologies, in lay terms, I like to summarize as we're going to make things and stuff. So what do we mean by that? Systems, technologies can be anything from an ATM. This involves the physical interface that you must interact with as well as the actual software and menu systems that are running uh, on that interface. Same with your smartphone. It has a, it's a physical device, but it also involves a software interface that you have to navigate. There's menus and submenus, and all of that has to be organized. Uh, this is also an example of what may be one of the most complicated uh, systems and technologies, which is the cockpit of a fighter plane. There's so many uh, bells and whistles and computer interfaces and gauges and buttons uh, and levers that the pilot has to operate again while they're flying several times the speed of sound doing maneuvers that force the blood from their brain. So why is human factors important? Uh, this comic strip that I have here uh, does a good job of illustrating the importance of human factors. This is uh, the bad boys of software. There's three of them. We have Microsoft Word, Rosetta Stone, which is the translation uh, so software, and then we have EverQuest, which is um, a first-person video role-play video game. And they're all sitting around uh, swapping war stories. So Microsoft Word says, yes, yeah. so at first I wouldn't load. Then when she was trying to do a table of contents, whammo, I crashed and took all of her data. And then Rosetta Stone chimed in, oh, that's nice. Then Rosetta Stone offers its war story. That's pretty good, but there was this one time I threw up like 40 hex-filled dialogues, and it freaked the user so much, he called in an exorcist and never turned his machine on again. But then EverQuest uh, chimes in with, once I killed a man, and they all fold. So this just illustrates that human factors ranges from inconvenience to safety. So the examples I gave at the beginning with when you pass the pepper, when somebody asks for the salt, it's just a matter of inconvenience. If you turn the you know, cold water on and have to wait a while before you realize it's not the hot water, that's inconvenience. But we also see plenty of examples of life or death issues that come from poor design or what typically gets called human error. So what type of things interest human factor psychologists? Uh, there's a variety of different topics. These range from aesthetic or how something actually looks and feels to uh, we are interested in product evaluation, product design, manual materials handling, uh, aging and disability, anthropometry, uh, office work and shift work, uh, controls, checklists for safety, how we lay out equipment, um, and just how people behave in the workspace. Uh, in particular, human factors, psychologists are interested in what's known as human-centered design. Human-centered design is when you study the human and try to establish what their needs are as well as their capabilities and limitations, and then you go out and find technologies that meet those needs. Or you go out and modify a technology so that it will meet those needs. Or you'll go out and, and innovate a new technology that will meet those needs. And this is different from traditional design where we focus on the technology and developing it, and then we seek out uh, humans and, and, and try to find a need for that technology. We're also, also interested in usability, and this is pretty self-explanatory. How usable is a product that we buy? These are some kind of farce examples of 
uh, poor usability uh, or poor products that would do poorly on a usability test. Uh, obviously, these matches would warrant a, a lawsuit of some type. Uh, we're interested in safety and human error, so we want to design products or systems and technologies so that they are safe and that people can't make errors. But if there's a chance they do, we also want to design possibly warning labels that reduce the chances of them making an error. Uh, here we have examples of some different warning labels and if you don't work at a construction site or one of these places and are familiar with this, it may do you no good. Uh, this one on the bottom, we see uh, if you try to guess what it is, I've heard anybody say this means soap dispenser to uh, beware of falling acorns, um, but it's actually fixed obstruction. But the only way to know if these uh, warning signs are effective and actually improving safety would it be some type of, do some type of testing on them. We're also interested in what's known as human computer interaction. This is the study of obviously how people interact with computers. Uh, this is a picture from Minority Report. If you've ever seen that, Tom Cruise is opening computer windows and moving them around and closing them out uh, just seamlessly. And that's just not how we interact with computers. It's more clunky than that. It's getting better, but you know, we're closing windows. Sometimes we accidentally close the wrong one. We're, we're getting frustrated when we don't save a document properly or we're trying to navigate through a menu system and we get lost where we're at. So we want to in improve that for people. We're also interested in what's known as man-machine interaction. And this is just how people interact with machinery. And machinery can be anything from your vehicle that you drive to some a large piece of equipment the size of this, this room uh, in an industrial setting or some kind of factory. We're interested in training, uh, which is what we call education in industry. So if we can't make the product perfectly intuitive to just walk up and use, we want to supplement that with some type of training or some type of curriculum or a program or certification that someone would need to go through. We're interested in what's known as user experience. That could be, you know, how you feel when you're using your phone or how frustrated you get if you accidentally send a text to the wrong person because of the way the menu system is designed to maybe the process uh, that you uh, experience you have when you check in at some kind of resort. Um, we're also interested in efficiency. We want things to, to run smoothly and we're interested in information architecture. This is how do we organize information so that it's intuitive and it uses the language that users would use uh, so that they could easily navigate uh, something like say a, a website or a computer interface. I mentioned earlier anthropometrics. This is the study of human body measurements. Um, and how we can take different lengths of human body segments and apply that to the design of, say, a workstation or uh, seating in a cockpit so that it can accommodate the 5th percentile female, that's like kind of the smallest female, up to the 95th percentile male. So we may need to make a seat adjustable or a table adjustable so that anybody can be accommodated by our designs. You find human factor psychologists in academia doing research as well as in uh, government or military and in private industry uh, doing some type of consulting or design work. Another area of industrial psychology is industrial organizational psychology. It's also known as IO psychology and it can be defined as the development and application of psychological theories and principles to the workplace. So basically they study people and how they behave and, and then they apply that to uh, the job. So the industrial end of IO psychology is interested in what are known as job analysis and that's, uh, there's some overlap there with human factor psychology. We're, we call it work analysis but it's the same thing. We're going to look go through and look at what type of skills that you have to have and what type of task you're going to be uh, asked to do when you perform a job. They're also interested in what's known as personnel selection. That's the hiring process. How, what, how can we study people so that we can better select individuals for a certain position? They're also interested in training, and developing training protocols and programs, as well as performance appraisal. This would be used in the hiring and firing process or maybe even the promotion, uh, justifying a promotion. On the organizational end of IO psychology, uh, the interest 
are on motivation. So what uh, gets employee morale up and gets them motivated to be productive. Uh, they're interested in leadership. How do we select people uh, for certain positions? And teamwork, as well as organizational stress and how that affects performance on the job. They're gonna be the ones who organize um, some type of executive retreat where you build these, uh, you know, work on team building exercises and trust um, issues. So that's a, a high level overview of human factor psychology as well as industrial organizational psychology. My name is Nathan Klein, and if you have any questions about these two topics, please feel free to email me at incline at lander.edu. Thank you.